One must imagine. Escu One must imagine happy. Escu is happy. One must imagine Escu One is happy. One must imagine Escu is happy. One must imagine Escu is happy. One must imagine Escu is happy. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll uh, we'll see about that one. Welcome back. And if you're new here, hi, I guess. Uh, this is part two of the three-part railway series, so if you are new here and you haven't watched part one, I would highly recommend you do that, since I'll be jumping straight into it here. But if you're going to be rude and ignore me, or need a reminder of what happened, here was my team. It used Zayn and Tethy Eagle only. These three fights were covered, and here's how long they took. Recap over. Now let's continue onward to segment two. After completing Drenched Gossipium, I had spent enough time thinking about my team for Segment 2 that I was ready to get into it the next day. Which was a horrible, horrible mistake, and by the way, I'm not kidding when I say trying to construct the worst team requires a lot of factors to be taken into account. And I absolutely spent the longest time coming up with the team for this segment. The reason why? Well, in Segment 1, I made my team have a lot of blunt attacks because Gossipium was blunt resistant. But that was the only fight where my damage could be, and was, truly awful. Here though, Skin Prophet and Ardor Blossom Moth are both highly resistant to Pierce, and Ambling Pearl isn't particularly weak to it. So it's by far the worst damage type for all three of these fights. The thing is, I already knew a lot of IDs that were bad and used Blunt primarily, but Pierce was a lot trickier to pick out truly awful IDs for. In addition, I just wanted to swap out my team more. It would lead to more variety in the IDs I used, which I think is just more fun overall in terms of a viewing experience. Not for me, of course, but you already knew that, so since I had the opportunity to use the few bad Pierce IDs in the game, I wanted to take that opportunity. In terms of what I built my team around even further, my prime worry during this segment was, pretty expectedly, Ardor Blossom Moth. A fight that lives in infamy for having far above average rolls, partly due to natural coin rolls, but also just a high offense level, and straight up one of the highest rolling skills in the game that punishes you immensely for losing to it. And the counterplay to its extra clash power was a DBS check, I was unsure I could win. In fact, that's actually a lie, I was sure I could not win it. A worse team for this segment would surely have to be awful for this fight, but again, it works out very, uh... Nicely, I guess, that Skin Prophet happens to resist the same damage type as we talked about, but also basically the same sin affinities. Specifically, Wrath is 0.2 times effective against Ardor Blossom Moth, and Wrath is a really common affinity on some of the bad IDs. And just in case I could find some bad IDs with both Lust and Wrath, Lust would be ineffective against both of them. And I'm sure you can kind of see where this is going. Lust and Wrath are both common sin affinities to find together. However, most of the IDs that have them, I hadn't considered to be truly the worst in a general sense, which is why it was time to finally bring some of them out for a debut in Segment 2. As for who to replace, this actually wasn't much of a debate, though that may surprise you. Svyrodian, Sloshmill, and Base Merceau were clearly too good for this segment, which might sound crazy to you, but just trust me. There's two reasons for this. One was unique to Sloshmill, and I came to the realization after I traversed through the abnormalities that inflicted bind onto me that free bind application is pretty good, and wouldn't be inconsistent like it was in segment 1, so not having her bind would be pretty devastating. But the main reason was Gloom. Skin Prophet and Ardor Blossom Moth are both weak slash fatal to Gloom, and while you might understand the logic immediately behind removing Zvi Rodian and Base Merceau, since their Gloom skills are relatively powerful, and I use that word very loosely, and they have Sloth, another strong sin for this segment, but Sloshmo was also originally removed because of Gloom, and the bind reasoning only solidified it in my mind later. But did I really remove her because of her single coin Gloom skill 1? That seems weird. But you have to realize something. Snag Harpoon was basically my skill 1, since spamming it was completely for free, and Gloom and Wrath resources were just highly abundant. Gloom would have indeed become more scarce, but I don't think I need to justify myself further on the decision to remove Sloshmill, since it means her two fans in the entire world are happy to see her sit this one out. 
So now our team was just base Faust, BL Otis, who once again had a skill 3 with favorable damage type and sin affinities, but 5 6 of our kit was awful for this segment, so I let her on through, and Zvi Sinclair, who yes, had Gloom and Sloth, but was also still Zvi Sinclair, so, you know. So, with my full criteria for what IDs should, could, and would be used for this segment, I scrounged through a Goodwill box at a shady dollar store, and I came back with these three IDs to complete my team. Hailing from the Liu's least drift out section, Liu Merceau joins the team. This is an ID I considered putting on my original Railway 2 team, and he has his upsides over base Merceau, as well as his downsides. He has a better speed range, though it's still not great at 2 to 5. He has a whopping 4 better offense level, which sounds like an insane benefit to have, and it is for his skill 1 and skill 3, which just rolls pretty alright on its own, but his skill 2 is so much worse, it's not even funny. And frankly, an 11 rolling skill 1 with plus 1 offense level isn't really winning any clashes anyways without some help. So having that be the majority of my clashing ends up being kind of worse than base Merceau whose skill 2 can be used as a relatively reliable clashing tool, meaning 2 sixths of his clashing is acceptable compared to Liu Merceau's 1 sixth. However, the biggest downside should be obvious. With a Lust skill 1 and a Wrath Pierce skill 3, any extra damage gained from that 4 offense level difference would be lost to the ineffective and more than ineffective resistances to my attacks. In case you don't believe me, Guess how much damage Perfected Death Fist, a 14 rolling skill with 3 coins, did to Ardor Blossom Moth. The minimum possible damage would be 3, but luckily for Liu Merceau, he uh, at least gets to triple that. And yes, this was with 3 heads in. Truly uh, spectacular. Next up was Base Dawn, an entirely new sinner to this challenge. Now look, I don't think Base Dawn is a horrible ID, but she's actually the closest thing to a truly bad ID that is also Mono Pierce. Because, let's be real, she still isn't that good. Single coin skill 1 and skill 2 meant that gaining sanity back on her would be a pain, made even worse by the fact that she would be entering the segment with 0 SP due to her being a new sinner. A 16 clashing skill 2 with plus 2 offense level would end up becoming one of my best clashing tools, and she actually has decent speed, but not decent enough to ever reach this god-awful conditional on her skill 3, making her numbers 11, 16, and 12. Now, unironically, this is probably the best ID I ever brought into the railway, and I'll talk about why that is during the fights, but I still think my logic behind fielding her was correct, since she also gave us our first taste of Envy. Now, this is a double-edged sword, and while this is going to sound crazy, I think I genuinely would have rather just never generated Envy for this segment of the challenge. In case you forget why I am having a visceral reaction to Envy generation, Sunshower Heathcliff's support passive would end up being active during this segment. Now, the most, uh, intelligent half of my viewers just said aloud, Well, um, just don't get hit, Esku. It's not that hard. Simply win your clashes. First of all, I'm gonna shove you in a locker and steal your lunch money again. Second of all, let's look a little ways ahead to just give you an idea of why this poses a problem outside of just winning clashes. Skin Profit, every turn, does three unclashable attacks while the candles are not lit. While yes, the addition of Base Dawn also gave me a new evade to work with, evades with a base of 2 didn't matter if I rolled a base of 2 due to low sanity. Granted, this would only lower sanity if the target was the lowest SP center to begin with, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it properly. With a new center came new ego, and this was honestly the strongest part of running a Dawn ID since we get access to La Sangre de Sancho and the, at the time, newly released Wishing Cairn Dawn. Oh, by the way, this was the support ID I used during this segment, so you will see her equipped with Fluid Sack, even though it was never used in battle. I won't lie and say that a small part of me wanted to use Base Dawn just to try out Wishing Cairn for the first time, but I knew off the jump that La Sangre de Sancho was a particularly good base ego for this challenge, in a very different way that something like Tipathos Mathos was strong. La Sangre de Sancho provided healing, specifically by 50% of the damage dealt, but also on hit if the target had bleed via the passive. Now, before you get too excited, La Sangre de Sancho is Lust Pierce. If it wasn't, I don't think I could have let this fly since the healing would have been too easy. I knew at the very least, this meant any attempt to heal on Skin Prophet or Moth 
was basically moot due to my damage type and sin affinity. And losing 10 SP on Dawn mattered a whole lot more due to her low skill floors and lack of coins. Wishing Karen was just genuinely solid though, but came with a heavier Sandy cost that was hard to get back. Three attack weight, Sloth Blunt would be pretty good into this segment on its own, but some extra bleed count could potentially be used in tandem with Lissandra de Sancho's passive, or even just its bleed application, and as established last time, five tremor could actually make a difference, even though not having Slosh Mull for Snagger Poon Tremor Bursts, nor Base Merceau for his skill 2, hurt my tremor setup in a big way. Two paralyzed on Heads Hit is obviously pretty good too, since Dawn had the capability to go first relatively often, but again, Strong by this challenge's metric, yeah. Ban worthy, no, I don't think so. Now, some of you may be thinking that Endon is also a good candidate for this slot, and that's not incorrect. But my gluttony deficit was still going to be a problem, and Endon would fix that, and she was far tankier than base Dawn, and had potential to debuff the enemy next turn with that skill 3, even if it would deal next to no damage due to being Wrath. She would also help to make up for the lost Tremor Soldiers, but more importantly, she synergized too well with our last edition, Enrodian. Now, you just had one of two reactions. What do you mean? I use Enrodian all the time, she's good. Or, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I think Enrodian on an N-Corp team can be an ID that is usable, I guess. However, man, yeah, even though her offense level is plus 3, which is by far the highest we've seen on an ID so far, and her skill 1 was the best skill 1 I had, her skill 2 still clashes at a 10. Not as bad as Vi Sinclair, thankfully, due to that aforementioned offense level, but still just barely usable. And her skill 3 was a nuke skill that clashed at a 12, but was Wrath. So, nuke is not a word I would use for this segment. Her speed range is 3 to 7 which means my speed issue is actually way better than before, but as I said before, if I kept Slosh Mill, it would be a complete non-issue, whereas I still ended up struggling here occasionally, though not as bad as you might think. Important to note though are based on and Enrodian's damage type resistances. Based on resisting Pierce is neat for skin profit, but both of their blunt fatality was a problem when the vast majority of attacks in this segment are blunt. Most notably, Arter Blossom Moth, of course, who was once again the main threat I built this team around. That's all for the IDs, but there was one change I made to the Ego I had equipped on my Sinners, and that was swapping over to Rhymeshank on Enrodian. I was very worried I just wouldn't have the damage to get anything done, like at all on Skin Prophet and Arter Blossom Moth, so I planned to save up my Envy, and then subsequently dump all of my Envy on those fights in order to speed them up. I was excited just to show off how good Rhymeshank's passive could be if utilized correctly, but well, you'll see. Other than that, here was the team going into segment 2 for the first time, with the only difference in support IDs being W Hong Lu since I'm now running a Bur ID, and Slosh Mole because she's up Taiwan and I'm not using her anymore. That's all for the preamble this time, so now let's properly get into segment 2. Usually in my videos, I like to ramp up to something. Start off calmer and with something I am less passionate about to make the video have a sense of progression, like how mermaids went into Silt Current went into Gossipium. Well, why am I talking about this? I hate Ambling Pearl. Because it being the first fight of Segment 2 fucks this all up. Welcome to the Insanity Arc. Yes, we are already here. I wish I was kidding. As some footage runs in the background, let's talk. So going back to that graphic I showed in the first part of this video with the potential run enders. At this point, I had already gotten past two of them. Silt Currents pretty easily, and Gossipium after five and a half hours, but that's not the important part. What is important to reiterate is looking down here at segment two, Clam was not a fight I perceived to be a threat. And yet, oh my god. Let's start with the more surface level problems. Based on is starting at zero sanity. If there's any part of Limbus's gameplay I hate the most, it's dealing with sanity loss mechanics, and tied into that is just playing on lower sanity in general. I don't mind taking odds that heavily favor me but aren't guaranteed and then losing. What I do mind are 50 50s, or honestly, anything from a 50 50 to a 70 30 just feels devastating when you lose, for some reason. 
Whereas if I lose a 95% chance, I can just convince myself the game has it out for me, and it's not my fault at all. Not that a 50-50 or 70-30 is my fault either, but it's a mental thing. Based on has single coin skills, as previously mentioned, and this came with high highs, as in hitting heads, and low lows, as in hitting tails. Now, taking damage on base dawn when I lost these clashes inevitably was uh, actually okay. Probably the most okay ID to take damage on due to La Sangre de Sancho. However, what was important here was getting up my sanity, which meant that a lot of resets immediately came from did base dawn win her clash on turn one. This naturally led to longer resets than a fight like Gossipium. On that fight, I could know immediately before I even plan out my turn just based on pure targeting and a set of skills to reset. With Clam, that was partially a factor. Instant resets did exist, but more often than not, I would have to plan out my clashing carefully for turn one, which by the way, I had to do for basically every single turn for every single encounter in this railway. So runs where Dawn hits tails and loses a clash, those took about two and a half minutes each. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it adds up. And it's not like I was out of the woods once I won a single clash. But okay, sanity rambling aside, what else is wrong with this fight? Quickly, I'll mention Zvi Sinclair's skill 3, whose 10 aggro has no more potential to be redirected via other aggro sources. Zvi so Rodian and Sloshmill are gone, meaning if speed ranges ever didn't favor me, which thankfully they mostly did, he was eating every single attack in the game. However, there's a much more relevant problem. And well, it's something I thought I could deal with, but you've probably realized by now that I just can't. Green Slimes. These are enemies that really act more like a stage hazard, or like the meat piles in Greta's fight in Ruina. They don't attack, thank god, but they do something worse, so I guess, unthank god. If by the end of the turn they aren't dead, Green Slimes will do their best impersonation of a YouTube comment section below a tier list video and spread toxicity everywhere. Poison is a relatively underutilized debuff in Limbus, and works more like a Ruinous status than a Limbus one, since instead of potency and count, it just has potency and then halves at turn end. The issue is with how much potency is applied. 4 by default, increased by 1 for every green slime alive. On turn 2 of the encounter, Ambling Pearl will summon 3 green slimes and use 1 predation. This skill slurps up the delicious filth and gives him some of the green slime buff. We'll talk about what that does in a little bit. This turn had me pretty stumped for a while. I obviously had to clash his attacks. There was no way of getting around that. So three to four of my skills are used to clash. I would say three to four instead of just four, since I could get lucky with targeting and be able to evade two of his skills, but that was unlikely and I couldn't just reset over for it. Then with my leftover skills, I could sometimes kill one extra slime or I could sometimes kill the slime that Ambling Pearl planned to destroy, which was also speed range dependent, of course. Killing an extra slime meant less poison on me, which is delightful, but it meant Ambling Pearl gained green slime, which meant that this passive would take longer to activate. Reducing Ambling Pearl to zero green slime was pretty paramount to winning, since this staggered state allowed me to actually deal a ton of damage into the pearl body part, since it became extremely vulnerable to all damage types and sinfinities. Combine that with Ambling Pearl's relatively low max HP, and this should be done and dusted in basically no time, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wish. You probably noticed my emphasis on the word sometimes when I said sometimes kill one extra slime. In case it somehow slipped your mind, my damage sucks. Here are the green slime stats, a measly 25 HP, neutral to everything except for being weak to gloom, of which I have none, and wrath, of which I have some. I could one-shot these with only two of my skills, Enrodian's skill 3 and Leo Mursault's skill 3. These were my trump cards of sorts, but they were also just my best skills, in general. This meant I would have to use my best skills to kill a green slime, meaning that if I got Ambling Pearl staggered and I'd used up those skills to get to this point, that's it. I would deal next to no damage to the actual abnormality itself during the time I needed to deal damage. And oh, by the way, most of the attacks done by Ambling Pearl are done by its shell, which just takes no damage. And any extra damage I had needed to go towards killing the green slimes, meaning at most, when Clam wasn't staggered, I could get one 
hit in on the pearl body part for maybe mediocre damage. Now, I will say BL Otis's skill 2 and 3 could kill green slimes, but only once to Pathos Mathos's ego passive has fully ramped up, which didn't help for turn 2's green slimes, which are by far the most problematic. What's even worse is that poison staggers me. Unlike the Gossipium fight, where I literally could not be staggered, even if Lifetime Stu Sinclair really tried his best, Ambling Pearl made being staggered an inevitability unless I got some insane RNG. Now you might be thinking, like I did, how do I kill the slimes easier? Surely my AoE options, especially Wishing Cairn Dawn, could one-shot the green slimes. Surely, since it rolls a 27 on heads hit and the slimes have 25 HP, I bet you would think it would one-shot... Because I did too. It doesn't. I think the difference maker is that Wishing Cairn Dawn has a minus 2 offense level compared to the green slimes neutral defense level, but goddamn, it hurt. You also might look at this attempt on screen and think I'm quite close to done, right? Here's the thing. Look at my health. Look at my poison. Even if I were to end the fight that very turn, which is not possible, I still take 27 poison damage at the end of the fight. That is health Zvi Sinclair never gets back. I can also basically never nuke down the pearl body part since I lacked bind options now to be able to go before the abnormality. And oh yeah, Ambling Pearl's speed gets set to 3 automatically whenever it uses predation, meaning sometimes I just had to let him eat a slime, or in the worst case scenario, I had unlucky targeting on someone like Zvi Sinclair and I couldn't redirect. You also might have noticed some slight stuttering in the footage, and that's because Limbus was trying to do everything in its power to make me annoyed, and just wasn't running well in general. You can imagine I wasn't having a good time. But at least, that's all the factors. <laughs> yeah, right. I haven't even talked about Larva, a super, super fun debuff that Ambling Pearl inflicts just to lower my Sandy in the game and in real life even further. These can be inflicted on hit, which, yeah, that's just a reset and it's my fault, or on use, which is not my fault at all. You know what else I haven't mentioned is the fact that this clam has got the schmooves, with an 8 plus 8 evade that inflicts 5 poison whenever it successfully evades. And also this skill that it likes to use semi-randomly, I honestly couldn't get a read on the rhyme nor the reason when this was used, since I thought it was after it was depleted to 0 green slime, but apparently not. Regardless, a base of 15 to a max of 25, that could win against the majority of my ego options, with the easiest ones to win being on Dawn, whose sanity started at 0. Admittedly, the green slimes did help give me a sanity boost, but I was never at 45 unless I used representation emitter multiple times. Oh wait, I couldn't do that. Remember how Gossipium was a fight that basically comes down to the wire, requiring you to use stronger attacks as you get to the end due to the red stain phase never expiring? Well, my resources were shot. I had zero gluttony going into Clam, so I would often just reset at the very beginning to start with Faust slash Dawn's skill 3, which were my only gluttony generating skills. Meaning that while my lust generation no longer solely relied on Otis, in fact it was overly abundant now but with no good ego to use it on, my gluttony supply would come in as slowly as ever. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the abnormality check during this fight because making Ambling Pearl lose 3 green slime was really good, but god damn it, the downside of winning this check sucks. And I basically had to take that damage on Dawn since her health was the most renewable thing even though it destroyed her sanity which was by far the hardest thing to build up. And still, the worst part of this fight was that I didn't see it coming. I for some reason thought I would somewhat easily be able to kill the green slimes and then nuke down Ambling Pearl and then move on to the actually problematic fights. But no. I stopped recording all of my attempts for a while, I just sat and reset and reset, and reset, and I would occasionally record when I got a good run. But this was the second low point of the railway for me. Probably the second lowest overall. Basically within 24 hours of each other, I had lost to Gossipium after getting so close, and now Clam was just breaking me down. I cannot stress enough how unfun this fight was. While Clam's patterns were predictable, I could only reset for skill RNG so much. So killing slimes on turn 2 was a lottery at best. Not to mention my poor supply of resources in Sandy, which while it was my fault, I was not about to go back and redo fights. Eventually though, I realized I very likely just didn't have enough health to go around. Nor did I have the patience to go around. Mostly that last one. Slime poison was basically an uncontrollable factor that was guaranteed to go off at least 
once or twice, with admittedly varying amounts of actual potency application, but always guaranteed damage on Zwei Sinclair. And it's not like it was a small amount most times. About two and a half hours into clam fights by my rough estimate, and after getting close to victory a few times with just far too much damage on me, I had to make a pretty drastic change. So here's my thought process. I don't know if I'll keep this in. I don't know if I'll keep any of this in. But I know that too much chip damage on Zwei Sinclair, and I'm sure I've talked about it already, too much chip damage on Zwei Sinclair is the end of the road. If I get past Clam, which I can, I definitely can, that previous attempt showed me that I could, with better luck, that was very unlucky, uh, missing a lot of coins. God, I hate green slimes. They're just just enough health that they're really annoying. Um, and they're worse than umbrellas too, because they damage me. But I can heal everybody else with soup. <laughs> Inconsistently. But I can heal everybody else with soup. I can't heal Zvi Sinclair. It's just like Railway 2. So, I think... I need to compromise on some aspect of this run. And if there's any aspect I'm willing to compromise on first, it would be changing to a support passive. That's actually good and useful. And so I think I'm going to do that because if I don't, then I could very well, I could very well be doing this for nothing. I get past Climb, I get past Skin Profit, but then I just don't have health for Art of Blossom Moth. And then I have to make bigger compromises by that point if I don't want to go back and redo it. So I think... I think I'm going to put... Base Gregor on the bench. And I'll leave it at that for now. Base he's saying would be too good. <sighs> yeah, I think I have to do this. I think... I, I, I th The support passives being the worst were always... The most unrealistic part of this run which is crazy to say but i think that's true because everybody has access to base gregor like you have to be stupid to do to do this so not that this run's meant to prove anything in that regard but the fact that i don't have slosh mill bind anymore is really really bad and i also don't have effervescent corrosion bind because i need to use rhyme shank on our blossom moss so i yeah I think I'm going to do that. So, yeah. Uh, you might be able to tell, but I really, really did not want to do that. Frankly, it was a perfect storm of annoyance, frustration, and some genuine insight that made me come to that conclusion that Gregor was basically needed. At the very least, it did a lot for my morale, which, trust me, I really needed above all else. Even though base Gregor would only provide 5 HP on the bench a turn, it was renewable health. Now, I want to clarify something. This wasn't a run saver. It didn't fix my team. This was like having wax wings and trying to fly. It would work. Kinda. But if you flew too close to the sun, that shit is still gonna burn. Oh yeah, that's... that's fitting. Anyways, I know you can say that the worst team challenge by my own definition ends here and that I failed, and I should be ashamed. But as I said in that clip, if there's one aspect I was willing to compromise on in this run, it was always going to be support passives. And while I didn't expect to have to make a compromise here, getting to Art of Blossom Moth only to fail due to mistakes made all the way back at Ambling Pearl probably would have meant you never get to see this video in the first place. I digress though. Now we have base Gregor on the bench, and everything is solved. I beat Ambling Pearl first try, if it were opposite day, maybe. Yep. We are still losing. Another half an hour goes by without getting good enough luck. Not even close, actually. I felt further away from victory than ever, and this is the point I started doing these little dev diary segments a lot more, so I apologize for the less good mic quality and the pauses, but I think having my live commentary is important. But I came to another devastating conclusion after those 30 minutes had passed. Something else this time, well within the rules, thankfully, needed to change. I have come to another realization about 30 minutes later after doing attempts with base Gregor on the on the bench. And I think 
It really sucks, but I think I can't use Rhyme Shrank. Which really, 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 really hurts. But I think it... I think I need a Crescent Corrosion. Which is fitting for the fight it's on. But, uh... Man, I, I realized I just don't know how I'm going to deal with this fight. And I don't know how I'll do a Skin Prophet without some decent AoE. This is... Brutal. <laughs> it's... Man. Okay, time to swap back. That's right, no Rhyme Shank. The red herring I set up at the beginning of this video was no more. This meant prospects for the future were <laughs> probably even more grim than how they were without Base Gregor on the bench, so that's great. I apologize, by the way, for how depressing the tone of this video can be so far, but really, this is the genuine experience. Being beat down by these fights and knowing when I had to bend was humbling in the most horrible way. Also, yes, whenever I wanted to swap out something on my team, I had to fish through my 200 support IDs to find the one person with base dawn equipped with max stuff. So, forgive me when I point out that I forgot to change off of Liu Hong Lu one time, and he's gonna stay there till the end of the segment. I scrubbed through my footage, he never activated, just figured I would point it out for you so I don't get comments talking about how I cheated and didn't say anything about it. Anyways, with Effervescent Corrosion on my side, I actually could one-shot the Green Slimes if I had activated Enrodian's passive the turn prior for the one damage up. I actually only realized this near the end of my final clam attempt, since I was confused why I was one-shotting sometimes and wasn't other times, but it was an inconsistent strategy anyways, and still required me to hit heads at a 75% chance at best, but it was a silver lining when it did happen. And yes, Believe it or not, what you are seeing on screen was my last attempt at Ambling Pearl. I know. I know. It looks horrible, and you are right. But after just around four hours and some odd minutes of fighting Ambling Pearl, well, I'll let Pastescu give his thoughts on the state of my team. I'm not even happy, because I know it's not good enough. I also wasted resources on Sun Shower. <sighs> Maybe I can do something? I don't know. This is... This is real bad. Yeah, he wasn't thrilled, was he? Base Faust on 98 health, Base Dawn on 30, and the rest hovering around 70 to 90 HP left? I think I was pretty justified in thinking I would need to go back. But you already heard what I said, right? That's the last clam attempt. Now, in the past, I didn't know that. But I would not be going back to clam, surprisingly enough. And speaking of that fight, <laughs> wow, uh, it was genuinely sad for me to go back and watch the footage of it. It's one of the fights I remember most vividly because, again, I had this expectation that I would fly on through Segment 2 and then have an epic struggle against Ardor Blossom Moth. To get stuck on a stupid clam, it just, it wasn't climactic. I was bored, I was angry, and even when it was over, I was quite sour because I thought I would have to go back to clam hell. It didn't help that the frustration made me play badly. And I'm not kidding when I say I think clam is the fight I consistently had the most misplays on. Though it's probably hard to tell via the footage. The Painometer rates Ambling Pearl at a 9 out of 10. This might come as a surprise considering this took a whole hour less compared to Drenched Gossipium, but there's a very key thing about the metric of pain, and that's how much fun I had during the actual fight. It sounds obvious, but fighting Gossipium was tense, it was the end of a segment, getting through it was triumphant. There was a clear goal in mind. Clam, well, you saw my reaction. Clam is the first fight in the segment. There's no reason to celebrate getting past that, it should be a given. Clam doesn't really have an MVP ID or ego, but since I'm kind of obligated to give one out, I will hesitantly give it to Enrodian for her passive in combination with Effervescent Corrosion, one-shotting slimes, I, I guess. Oh yeah, and she was able to activate Effervescent Corrosion's passive, so Bind was somewhat back on the menu. Potentially not as useful as Rhymeshank, but still. 
I think Ambling Pearl is a completely fine fight normally, and it's not the same level of obnoxious DPS check as something like Steam Machine. But man, does it feel bad to start off a segment with just low health. Ambling Pearl is an okay fight that has an unfortunate cutoff for my team specifically. Do I hold that against it? Yeah, of course I do, but I don't think that it's badly designed. Except for the Abno check, because god, I hate forced HP slash SP loss mechanics like that. I won the check, for god's sake. Come on. Fox also had something similar in Real Way 2, and I hated it there as well. Anyways, I'm long overdue to move on to the next fight of Segment 2, so let's do that now. After the gauntlet that was Ampling Pearl, uh, thank you for sitting through 20 minutes of that, by the way, Skin Profit really is just a fight that exists. I don't think anyone can really disagree with me there, but uh, ugh, is this still quite a bit of a doozy to explain? Let's start with the obvious. I'm screwed. I have 5 HP healing a turn via base Gregor on the bench, but look at the state of my team. Zweiklair is at least relatively healthy, but being in relative health compared to someone literally knocking on death's door like base Dawn is, doesn't mean much. Now I say I have 5 HP healing a turn, but that isn't exactly true. Skin Prophet has these silly attacks with the silly keyword unclashable. Now I won't front and pretend like these attacks are particularly scary, and I actually have 3 of 8s this time around, so dodging these was relatively easy. But I was actually extremely unlucky with how my health ended up. And Rodian, Bielotus, and Liu Merceau were incredibly close to their stagger thresholds. I had no way of knowing this going into the fight, so this is just unlucky. And Otis was lust pierce fatal, and same with Liu Merceau. So if she ever dropped her evade, she was definitely being staggered, and Liu Merceau just don't let him get hit. And speaking of not hitting, Skin Prophet himself uses two counters during the turns the candles are not lit, and these are not to be taken lightly for two reasons. Number one, this is a 5 plus 5 counter, so the damage itself is decent, but it also inflicts 10 damage in the form of burn. Then he would heal 20 HP. That 20 HP heal means that attacking Skin Prophet during this phase is entirely pointless, since its resistances are so resistant that any damage I would deal would be healed back, and I would get hit for it. The next problem wasn't to do with Skin Prophet, but a stinky hobo who had now come online. Sunshower Heathcliff's support passive was active. Now, before I talk about how that affected the fight, just know that I could dump my envy via Chains of Others, but I knew that I would need some of those for Ardor Blossom Moth, and I was always going to gain more throughout the fight, and you also may see me use Screwless Wob to also dump my envy at some point. Now I know, dumping envy seems drastic for just 10 SP loss when hit. Sure, it's bad, but genuinely, why don't I just not get hit? Well, that's because, welcome to the soup segment. This is the fight where Lifetime Stew truly shows just how absolutely terrible it is in full force. Where to begin? Ah, yes, how about, how many enemies do you see on screen? Six, right? Well, Soup will always target the five candles due to their 28 max HP. And oh yes, that means what you think it means. In a fight where I enter at this level of HP, I could only ever reliably heal two of my allies with each usage of Lifetime Stew, and when I say reliably, I mean reliably by Lifetime Stew's standards. Now, that is definitely bad enough, right? That's what the soup segment was for, right? No. For some ungodly reason, Lifetime Stew hitting allies activates Suncliff's support passive. This meant if I tried to heal on turn 1, which was a pretty reasonable train of thought, Dawn would lose 10 SP. Also, any subsequent uses of Lifetime Stew in any fight where I had 3 plus Envy guaranteed that someone on my team lost SP, since I was almost always firing it off at 45 SP on Sinclair to try and guarantee heads hit. Now you may not understand why this upsets me so heavily. Since, while the wording is unfortunate, it is correct. Well, yes, that's true. But Lifetime Stew does not deactivate Otis's to Pathos Mathos damage up benefit from her passive, despite requiring you to not be hit at all during a turn. I assume the reasoning is that Suncliff's passive is meant to be a benefit, but 
God damn, was this terrible. The biggest problem here was definitely only being able to heal two allies at a time, but the shit stained cherry on top was potentially losing 10 SP for it. Also, this fight more than most others meant a reset if I hit Tails on Lifetime Stew, since if I ever had burn count on me, that 7 burn becomes a whole lot worse. And yes, that will also apply to Ardor Blossom Moth. Now, Suncliff's passive is not just a problem with Lifetime Stew, of course, since Skin Prophet does those three unclashable attacks, as I've mentioned. If I drop a coin or can't do anything about it, if it targeted the ID with the least SP, which was often Dawn since she started on the lowest SP to begin with, it would just snowball into that ID having less and less SP to win less and less clashes. And if you look at the state of turn one of this battle, there was no way to gain sanity outside of thankfully having access to representation emitter. Oh, wait, I can't because Clam drained me of my pride. In multiple ways, really, but specifically my pride ego resources in Limbus Company. So, let's talk about candles. Because these are a permanent fixture in this fight, and I need to have a strategy. So, there are three ways I could deal with them. Number one, just completely ignore them, spam defensive skills into skin profit to minimize damage taken. Two, Try to light all of the candles to advance skin profit to go into the next phase. And three, what I ended up doing, but let me talk about why the first two strategies won't work. Ignoring the candles is just the worst choice by far, since it means I'm doing nothing during the turns when they aren't lit, only generating three ego resources via the unclashable attacks hitting me and my defensive skills. And evades can fail or be a guard, which can lower my sanity when I'm hit even when shielded. Trying to light all of the candles sounds correct, but it was kind of hard to do that, and also it's easy to get somewhat overwhelmed if 3 plus candles are lit, since then 6 attacks are being used, or even more, meaning potentially taking damage, which meant potentially losing SP, which I had to work hard to get back to begin with. What I ended up doing was focusing down 2 candles, and only ever 2 and then using my next turns to clash and win against the relatively easy to beat skill that inflicts 6 burn and 2 burn count. 12 damage. Remember that for later, it'll be important. I could also generate ego resources this way, just attacking candles mindlessly. I still generally wouldn't go HP positive during these turns, since triple evading the unclashables didn't always happen. It was okay so long as the target of the attacks wasn't Leo Merceau or Beal Otis without evade though. All right. Now the fight proper. You may be wondering how the fight advances if I don't light the candles. I honestly didn't know myself, I thought it would just take forever, but it turns out he lights them himself after three turns of darkness. This was both good and bad, since comfortably sitting with two candle attacks and three unclashables until the end of time sounded alright to me. But this meant that this fight had alternating phases. Three turns which consisted of breaking candles and clashing with them, and trying to evade unclashables, then three turns of actual gameplay, and dealing pretty pathetic damage. But at least its resistance is dropped due to the candles being lit. Now, I know some people are going to bring this up, so let me talk about it. I didn't mention this little quirk in my Railway 3 guide because, frankly, I only learned about it around the beginning of the process of making that video, and also didn't think it was that important for an initial clear. Basically, if you snuff out all of Skin Prophet's candles before he does it himself, he throws a temper tantrum and uses the attack 6-5 on himself. This would speed up the fight immensely, since it reduces his max HP by 10% total, which means around 150 damage, and then he staggered the next turn. But think about it. How do I actually kill these candles? Well, either way, I would have to take the counters from them, which wasn't ideal, but manageable theoretically. The real issue came with genuinely how do I break the candle's shield? I have Effervescent Corrosion, which is why I wanted to bring it for this fight to potentially break the candle shield, Wishing Cairn, and Representation Emitter as AoE options. But Skin Prophet has two slot weight, so even if I used all of my extra AoE to kill the candles, I would need to target them with regular skills too. Remember, I do need to clash his regular attacks. The point being, I could do it on turns 3 to 5 only. We'll talk about that but I determined it wasn't worth the health, sanity, and ego resources I would lose because of it, since I would likely have to take some unopposed attacks from Skin Prophet along the way. So this fight was just gonna take a while, and honestly, that was good. Since I had Base Gregor on the bench, I figured I may as well fully use it to my advantage, otherwise why do I have him there at all? If I just stalled this fight out, I could hopefully slowly gain health and resources for Ardent Blossom Moth, even without optimal usage of Lifetime Stew. Now, initially I thought this was a stupid plan, 
because after the Abnormality check, Skin Prophet would gain 4 Fragile and 4 Damage Up, meaning he would die quicker and deal more damage with those unclashable attacks. But a friend in call with me convinced me to try and lose the check just to see what would happen. I figured it would simply punish me with something bad, but instead it was the best thing I could have asked for. I gained 1 protection and 1 damage down, and he gained defense level up and 1 attack power down. To any other player in any other situation, this is just a bad thing. But for me, it meant I could drag this fight out. But that came with its own risks. Marked is a unique debuff for Skin Prophet, and its description says this unit will be primarily targeted. This description is bullshit and doesn't give you the full picture of what this debuff does. Marked is applied whenever you win against 9-2, the attack of the Ego's namesake, which is a negative coin skill that should be scary, but I had a lot of Ego that could potentially clash against it, and Tabathos Mathos literally couldn't lose. However, this inflicts 10 burn when you win against it. I thought of damage in increments of 5, so that negated 2 turns of base Gregor healing, which was honestly completely fine. I made that up in the downtime turns between him actually attacking and me just defending. So the only issue came up when I fought and won a clash against this skill with an ID that was already marked, which you would think would make no difference, right? 30 burn. That's... that's not what the skill says. I chalked this up to the game tripling burn application when it tries to apply marked to an already marked ID. Not that the description would say anything about that, uh, I really had no clue, though. Until this moment here, when I tried to win a clash with Dawn at low-ish sanity and got hit by this attack. You know, the one that inflicts 6 burn and 2 burn count. So as I pause on this frame of the candle's attack, how much burn and how much burn count do you think I'll be inflicted with? What the fuck. So, I thought about it for a while, and I think that Marked just triples burn taken just in general, and it's not said anywhere, at least as far as I could tell. If someone knows why this happens, please tell me, and also, haha, yeah, I lost SP from Suncliff passive, making this situation even worse. Oh hey, by the way, this was an hour and ten minutes into an attempt. An attempt full of pain in various ways, but I'd managed to get this far. Honestly, it was in this moment that Dawn proved she was the best ID I used during this entire railway, because yes, La Sangre de Sancho healing is reduced by the candles being resistant to lust, but she was the only ID that could have possibly survived 8 turns of 18 burn potency. Skin Prophet was a fight that just became a back and forth of neither of us dealing any significant amount of damage, except at that fateful turn, 33 turns into a 41 turn endeavor. Through careful and terrifying usage of Lifetime Stew, as well as slowly utilizing Base Gregor's passive, I had finally managed to close out this fight after an hour and a half. Skin Prophet was a test of endurance, like Gossipium, but unlike Gossipium, I was in control for the majority of the fight. This took just around three and a half hours, with an hour and a half of those attempts being one attempt, and most of the other attempts died due to Suncliff ruining a single ID Sandy beyond repair. I'm not kidding. If you don't think I've ranted about that passive enough to justify how much I hyped it up, it's because my entire playstyle needed to change to accommodate for it. But I adapted well and decently quickly, so it wasn't that bad. Don't worry though, it'll get worse. Near the end of this fight, my heart was pounding. I was so scared of having to reset and do it all again, but I was very lucky it was Dawn that had the burn on her, otherwise I would have been here for 5 hours minimum considering one attempt takes an hour and a half. MVP ID slash ego for this fight has gotta be La Sangre de Sancho. Seriously, what a damn good base ego. Rolling a 26 with 8 bleed application and 50% of damage dealt healing, I probably would have banned it had I realized how good it would be to spam on candles whose body parts were broken, but honestly, knowing what I know about marked tripling burn for no reason, I think I needed the help. Because this fight without base Gregor passive would mean a ton more resets on Ambling Pearl, and you can't make me go back to that. It would also mean a ton more resets here, since every time you win against 9-2 after a certain point, you're taking 30 burn damage. What do you even do against that? Skin Prophet gets a 6 out of 10 on the Painometer, since I really can't justify putting an hour and a half long fight any lower down. I know I'm emphasizing that point a lot when it was by my own intention that the fight took that long, but goddamn, I was so stressed out something would go catastrophically wrong in those last couple turns, 
then I think it justifies the 6 out of 10 at least. Let's play a game. From a range of numbers, let's say 1 to, I don't know, 72, how many attempts do you think Ardor Blossom Moth took? That's right, I counted every single one. And it is within that range, but only just barely. Look, if you don't guess it within two numbers of the actual attempts, then you have to subscribe, or I guess like the video, whichever one you haven't done. I think that's a pretty fair price, add some real stakes to this game. Got your number? Good. So, let's talk about the easiest fight in the railway. No, 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 no changing your number now, because Ardor Blossom Moth was my only first try victory. There was just one reset and it was due to initial targeting, but that's it. I still count that as a first try victory for all intents and purposes. And frankly, I wish I could explain to you how I did it, but it just kinda happened. Moth has scary attacks. I've hyped it up this entire video. Just inherently high offense level and decent rolls meant that this fight was going to be incredibly reliant on ego, or debuffing. Specifically, my only option, and I really do mean my only option for clashing against Ardor Blossom Star, was Sun Shower Otis. And it can lose if I hit Tails, so restoring sanity should have been of the utmost priority. But I just never lost. I didn't even always hit heads. Ardor Blossom Moth just took pity on me. Another thing that made this fight weirdly easy was its speed range. I, I didn't actually know this before going into the fight and just assumed it was 2 to 4 or 3 to 4 or something like that. It's 1 to 2. This meant I was never in danger of speed ranges, especially due to the higher speed of my IDs innately, but even my slower team wouldn't have struggled at all. Hell, I don't even have enough footage to talk about this fight for very long. I went into this fight after beating Skin Prophet at almost exactly 12am midnight, and I was going to do a single attempt just to get an idea of how bad this fight would be, then go to bed. I didn't record the first six turns. That's how bad I expected this fight to go. Me marking this as a run ender on the graphic isn't a bait. I was worried about this fight just as much as someone would expect me to. Crafting my team to specifically deal as little damage to this abnormality as possible also wasn't intentional because I somehow knew this fight would be a first try victory. Funnily enough too, this fight went horribly, with the singular point of good luck being winning the clash against Ardor Blossom Star, and apparently that's all I needed. I hit Tails on Lifetime Stew when I had burn count on my team. I was basically actively taking as many risks as possible. I still won. It wasn't a clean victory, <laughs> no, no, no. It was messy as hell. Zwei Sinclair died, god damn his soul, but I think if I had to optimize this fight, I could have easily come out with no deaths. But this was a much, much needed morale boost. If Ambling Pearl was the it's so over portion of this segment, god knows. I needed a worse so back, and I was back. I'll let me from the past take it away, since I was flabbergasted, to say the least. Um... What... What just... What just happened? Why did I win the fight? This was... I beat Skin Prophet at exactly 12 a.m. It is 12.42. And I kinda see no reason to not take this. I can farm on mermaids. It'll be annoying, but I can farm. Everything that's not Envy, which, you know, there's really not a good place to do that. I... I, I think this is it. I think I... I second tried Heart of Blossom Moth, which I, I and I was I was really worried. I this was the reason, and I, again I'm sure I've talked about it, but this is the reason why I chose Leo Merceau based on like their attacks do nothing. Their basic attacks do nothing. I have this ego. I'm not gonna restrict ego further. Like this. Oh my god. Wow. It might not be over. Let me. Before I speak too soon. Okay, if that evaded, that would be bad. Is it enough? That's it? Second try. N not even. Like, honestly, first try. Here's the board state. 
zero pride, but that's kind of completely okay. I can farm pride. Basically, infinitely. Wow. Um, that was unexpected. Uh, <laughs> if I cut off... If I cut off the video at a part one at Skin Profit, this will be a very underwhelming start to part two. But I, I don't know. There it goes. Tre Tremor is good. It's just we kill things too fast for Tremor to really be good. So if you just if your team sucks, then Tremor is good. Uh, what a life lesson. I may go back and redo that fight to get it more optimal. And if I if I do, I'll show it. But. There's something really magical about getting that first try that I like a lot, so. Okay, I got a finalized team for, for segment three. Wow. That's, that's crazy. I, I would not have thought that. I would get that first first try, second try, whatever you want to call it. I, I, did, I wasn't even recording until halfway through because I, I was like, why is this run going so well? I thought I would be dead. Uh, honestly, like, the hardest fight so far is is still Gossipium. This was terrible. Gossipium was awful. Clam was really annoying, but that was mostly because Dom is at zero sanity. <laughs> well, you know, that was just by nature. And then this was actually relatively comfortable. Well, time to enter the end of the run one way or another. Because we all know Spiral's not stopping me. I guess I'll see you at Ahab. I never thought I'd be saying that so soon. Looking back at the footage, all I have to say is that Wishing Care and Dawn was helpful to increase my actual damage dealt, and Tremor helped me to reach that first stagger bar a little bit early. But I mean, come on, I, I have no thorough breakdown. It would be disingenuous for me to try to explain the problems or potential problems because I didn't run into them. It would just be wasting your time. Now, to my credit, this was partially because of good planning, like dumping my envy into chains of others to stop the unclashable mass attack from ruining my sanity via Suncliff passive, and also using chains at opportune times to try and minimize RNG. MVP ID slash ego for this fight had to be Sun Shower Otis, who flat out refused to let this attempt die for some reason. I respect the hell out of her for it though, since, again, after the soul-crushing clam and the marathon of skin profit, a gimme on a fight I expected to be hard was what I needed to balance out a hard fight on one I thought would be easy. Artablossom Moth gets a... I want to give it a 1 on the painometer, but I know that it could have easily been a roadblock, so I'll give it a... a, a 3? It being the last fight in the segment and not having serious healing like Gossipium kinda made it fall over a lot easier especially when I had multiple fights of resources to piggyback off of. You can point to base Gregor and say, oh, well, he clearly wasn't needed if this fight was so easy, do the segment again without him. Calm down. Maybe one day, but not for this challenge. If you're sad I'm not a battered and broken man at the live audio for this fight like you expected, that'll just have to wait for part three. But don't worry, this is the sole high point of the railway, and I wasn't about to go back and redo the fight to optimize, Getting it done on my first try was just way too good of a feeling. Eat shit and die, Moth. My wax wings carried me to the end. That's the end of segment two, and the end of part two of this video. I originally was going to talk about the Mermaid's Fight 2 in this video, but I had a little too much to say about Ambling Pearl, so part three will cover Mermaids up to Spiral of Contempt. In terms of the stats for the segments, it's a lot less lopsided than segment one, but Moth really brings down the average. 4 hours for Clam, and an unknowable amount of resets, 3 and a half hours for Skin Profit with around 10 to 15 resets, and Arter Blossom Moth took 40 minutes with 1 reset. About 8 hours for this segment total, but really that's due to a complete and utter fluke. This segment on the whole was definitely still harder than segment 1, and the upcoming segment with Spiral… well let me just say this. I said this was a 30 plus hour journey in part 1. We are at just around 16 or 17 hours. I'll let you guess where the majority of the time sync comes in in the comments, but we all know. Anyways, thank you for watching this part. Seriously, it's cool that people watch all the way to the end of my super long videos, so thank you in particular. 
I need to get to work on the last part of this challenge, which will likely be far and away the longest video on my channel, so I hope you look forward to it. This video ends now.